News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukut Ali. Hello, good evening and a very warm welcome to Newsline Live. Now then, Sri Lanka appears to be at a serious uh, juncture in its uh, checkered uh, independence for the last 72 odd years. And um, there are protests all over the place. Uh, there appears to be a new rule in the uh, penal code, uh, or so it appears. And uh, we thought we'd uh, interview somebody here and ask him all about what he thinks is going on uh, in our country, especially because the people are all over the place, from north to south or east to west, from the hills to the plains, they're all, at some time, are protesting. Here we go. Mr. Pakisoti Saravanamutu, Dr. Pakisoti Saravanamutu, I do beg your pardon. Very good evening to you. Good evening. And what do you make of it? The, 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 the Republic are all up in arms, literally. Yes, it would seem like the 6.9 lakhs of people or whatever it is, million people who voted for Gotabe Rajpaksa and then gave him a two-thirds majority that they are very, very dissatisfied and they are showing their dissatisfaction by demonstrating and in particular on social media by castigating the government left, right and centre for not living up to its promises, not providing the strong effective government that it promised at the elections. And so in a sense that whole coalition is fracturing and I think Sending Mr. Basil Rajapaksa, who is the founder, in fact, uh, of the SLPP to Parliament, is largely as an attempt to hold this coalition together rather than anything to do with the finance and the economic affairs of the country, because he was doing that anyway. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to come into Parliament to do it. But I think there is a sense on the part of the government that their coalition of uh, supporters is actually falling apart. I mean, I noticed that in the president's more recent speeches, he keeps saying that we have a plan. We are acting according to a plan because the chief criticism against him is, is that he has no plan whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it is ad hoc, you know. And there is this sort of sense, I think, that perhaps he's in some sort of bubble and that he doesn't really quite know what's happening. His brother Basil is now the Minister of Finance and also the person who is in charge of the party. Mm. Shavindra Silva is Army Commander and Lord High everything else as far as governance is concerned. Then you have the Ministry of Defence uh, and the Ministry of Interior mm. who go on and do whatever they want, particularly with regard to violating people's rights. Uh, so we don't really have a government in the sense of a cohesive, coherent government with a cohesive, coherent plan to govern. Um, talking about uh, the erosion of the people's rights, we saw a couple of days ago uh, at a protest, uh, some protesters were uh, arrested by the police. Uh, taken off to court, produced before a magistrate, uh, who apparently gave them bail. No sooner they came out of the courthouse, they were then forced, bundled off, bundled off for to quarantine. quarantine. Irrelevant of whether they had one jab, two jabs, or no jabs. And um, it appears to be, that this is the part I say, that it appears to be a new item in the penal code. Well, so this is the thing, you know, we have the notion of one country, one law. Yeah. But in actual fact, it's not the case at all. It might that be one country, but there's several laws. Well, several laws, sheer arbitrariness in the way in which the law is applied. It's disproportionately applied. There is no notion of due process. Hmm. There is also no notion of the separation of powers between the executive the legislature and the judiciary, mm. you know. So we really have a situation of misgovernance and at a number of levels, which I don't think this country has ever had. Mm -hmm. Even when we had the war, even when we had the JVP violence, and I'm thinking here also about the violence at the, la the late 80s, early 90s, 
you nevertheless had a strong government that knew what it was doing. We never agreed with what it was doing, but uh, nevertheless. But here, we don't get that sense of anyone really in charge, apart from the president doing this number of uh, coming out and giving the speeches about the vistas of prosperity and whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's platitudinous. Mm -hmm. It's hilariously funny at one level. And, uh, well, <laughs> what do you make of... Um, do you, do you seriously believe that they have any plan? I don't think they have any plan at all. I think they are doing it on, you know, <laughs> on a hope and prayer. They have no idea what they are doing. They see a problem, they go and immediately solve it. But that's the short-term solution, it's not a long-term solution, because there isn't a plan as far as that's concerned. So it is going from one crisis to another. At which point, uh, <coughs> Dr. Saravanamutu, do you think that uh, the people will stop voting uh, in uh, the same, the, uh, you know, the same, all virtually the same people based on the same promises? You know, they say, well, this time, give us the vote this time, and this time we'll do this X, Y, Z view. <laughs> but it never, uh, X, Y, Z is never No, abs absolutely. There is a problem in our political culture yeah. in that respect. We always complain about the government in power and all the politicians, and then we bring them back in again, maybe under a different party or whatever. But that is why I think that those of us who find this absolutely unacceptable need to get involved in politics to clean it up. There is no point in us sitting and complaining ad infinitum because it's a repetition. And, you know, the whole thing about first as a tragedy and then as a farce, history repeating itself, it becomes more and more farcical. So we are left, therefore, with the option which we have to try and get involved and try and clean it up. But, um <coughs> Several are the instances where the government um, attempt to uh, govern uh, by the use of uh, gazette notifications and uh, only to uh, rescind them soon after. Uh, it appears that they uh, do the thinking after uh, <laughs> the decision. Well, well, there you are. I mean, this government, COVID has provided the alibi for this government to produce gazette notifications almost at will, and then one is contradicting the other, they get overruled very quickly. Because there is no plan. I mean, if you had a plan, you're not going to have one gazette notification, then another one soon thereafter, uh, nullifying the previous one. D does that indicate to you that there's some sort of uh, mismatch um, between the presidency and uh, parliament? Oh, yes. I mean, the presidency after the 20th Amendment has been vested with enormous powers yet again. We've gone back to hmm. the Jaja Wadda presidency of 1978. Yeah? And parliament in this respect is purely a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. However, as we all know, if you have a huge parliamentary majority, you have to find jobs for the boys, and that is jobs in terms of giving them deputy ministerships, state ministerships, and whatever. Mm. So effectively, that parliamentary majority becomes part of the executive. But this, this It's this not there to debate laws and pass laws. It's a rubber stamp. Back when Mahindra Rajapaksa became the president in 2005, and uh, he wanted help, uh, so to speak, from the uh, opposition uh, to fight the war. Um, th he ap appeared to have an almost uh, some form of legitimacy in increasing the size of the cabinet and so on. I think uh, all but two of his uh, members uh, had uh, official portfolios. But uh, this has slowly crept in and become the norm. So again, once again, we have uh, a whole you know, phalanx of uh, people holding portfolios. No, so this is why we in civil society, whoever else, needs to point out that, look, this country was governed with less than 100 ministers. Yeah. We were governed with 10 or 12 ministers. There are countries today which are much larger than ours 
which are governed with 10 and 12 members in a cabinet. So therefore we have to show that this huge cabinet is a part of effectively a corruption. It is corrupting, buying the members of parliament over with ministerial portfolios and perks in order to make sure that when they have to vote, they vote with you. However, I think what's also happening is, is that given that it is a motley coalition of forces, there are rumblings. There are the Gothabe Rajapaksa faction, there is the Namal and Mahindra Rajapaksa faction, there's Basil. So, but anyway, the factions are all members of the family. Mm -hmm. So one is told that when push comes to shove, that they all stand together. But if push does not come to shove, they nevertheless do their own number and without any kind of coordination, without any kind of plan, as far as the country is concerned, and the country goes to rack and ruin. Um, thank you very much for your questions um, by SMS 0772 300 I'll read this one out. It says, Ministers like Sarat Virasekar uh, appear to be blatantly violating the rights of the public by authorizing police brutality, um, manhandling women, elderly women, in fact, and using quarantine as a forcible as a form of forcible detention while those who celebrated basil's entry uh, why were they not arrested uh, they were out there blatantly breaking the rules and that that's a point Th this particular question may be just one question here but the social media is full of the same question no, absolutely this is a government that says there is only one law in one country but the actual reality is that there is one law for all of, all of us. And as far as they are concerned, they can get away with impunity. In your analysis, Dr. Saranamutu, do you think that there is a real danger of some form of anarchy? Well, I mean, there is a danger of some sort of anarchy in that people may come out onto the streets because they are frustrated, they are angry, they can't f afford the three meals a day for their children, they can't get the medicine, they can't pay for their education, all of that and they may come out onto the streets. But at that point, my suspicion is, is that Gotha Bairaj Paksa, president of this country, who only goes to the military for anything and everything, may well order the army into the streets. What has it all done to um, our foreign policy, uh, our foreign relationships, our in, you know, diplomatic well, relationships? There is no foreign policy in this country. Right. I don't think anyone can ever talk about any kind of foreign policy. What it has done for our diplomatic relationships is, is that it has messed them up left, right and center. You know, we all know that from the Millennium Challenge account to the port, the Eastern uh, Terminal, to the uh, energy pl energy uh, things up in Manor, and all of that, that, those things were grossly mismanaged. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, we know that with regard to Geneva, we totally mismanaged that. Hmm. You know, now we seem to be wanting to be nice to the European Union because the European Parliament has passed the resolution considering getting us, getting rid of GSV Plus for Sri Lanka. But we must get our act together fast enough in order to be able to resurrect, salvage something from the mess that we're in as far as foreign policy is concerned. Do you think there is a relationship between uh, this uh, lack of uh, diplomatic relationships and the fact that Sri Lanka was, uh, be, has, was on the hunt for 600,000 doses of AstraZeneca all the time when its uh, uh, Commonwealth mentor, uh, Britain, had uh, uh, plenty of it in stock, way millions over uh, what they needed in their island. And uh, they appear to, to have been uh, um, silent in responding to our government's plea. Well, it may well have happened. It may well have happened like that. 
On that note, we'll go for a short break and uh, take a look at the uh, headlines for this evening's primetime news from News First. We'll see you on the other side. News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukutali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. I'm in conversation with Dr. Pak Yusoti Saramunamutu, who's, of course, the executive director at the Center for Policy Alternatives, CPA. Now then, um, you can see that on social media, people are taken to uh, social media to vent their frustration and anger, uh, and I suppose desperation, because 62% of our country is, uh, uh, they, they work in the informal sector, they're mm -hmm. daily waged and so on, and uh, lockdowns just don't help them um, as much as the health authorities might want that. But what, uh, well, how uh, good an indicator or how accurate an indicator is all this stuff on the social media. We, today we had one uh, where a, a young, youngish man was um, scathing in his attack. Now, I think the argument that the government will put forward is, is that this is a very small percentage of the population and that it's either inspired or manufactured by the opposition and sent to God knows everyone around the country and that it's not the real people, as it were. But I think this time around, it has changed. It is fairly widespread that most people have lost confidence in the president and in the government. You know, it started off, I think, where people were castigating the president and saying that he is not effective, he is not decisive, all of that. But now it has gone to the government as well. And it also feeds into the general frustration and anger with the politician mm -hmm. who is seen to be living in a bubble of his or her own, getting new cars, all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, that they live in a different world and that for the average ordinary person in this country now is a very bad situation indeed where they cannot feed their children, get the medicine for their children and ensure that their children get an education. It is actually the height of callousness um, when we find out, the public finds out that um, the government inside this huge challenge uh, uh, for foreign exchange and, and other matters had uh, ordered um, 227 vehicles for uh, parliamentarians. Um, mysteriously, the letter of credit being opened by a state bank was done uh, several weeks before the cabinet approved the purchase and a week later they rescinded that and then came the news that well it's all too late because we've already we'll sent the money. money thank you very much Jack that is absolute callousness when the people are suffering for a lack of medicines lack of medical facilities and God forbid that if the numbers were higher uh, and we needed more ventilators we'd have a real problem well so one of the ways in which one can sort of release the frustration and anger of the people is we have provincial council elections which are long long overdue mm. and then we have local government elections now <coughs> local government elections are due I think in 2023 whereas provincial council elections can be had any of these years because there are no elected provincial governments but this would be a way in which people will have a chance to vent their frustration and indeed this would also be a way in which the SLPP will be able to find out as to how low they have sunk as far as public regard and esteem is concerned. Or, or, we or whether the social media is only a minority and exactly. so we don't have to bother about it. Exactly. Um, <coughs> Th that's another thing here. There is this um, ongoing um, and increasing uh, sort of uh, vigilance about what goes on on, uh, on social media. And we have reports that uh, 
uh, the CID and various other police authorities or whatever uh, are investigating people who forward messages because they may not be um, you know they may not be exactly accurate but people are forwarding them I suppose in a bid to find out if in fact it is accurate but we are living in a situation in which what the government says is accurate is not believed by most people. So when the government loses trust and confidence, when the people lose trust and confidence in the government, where are they going to, to find the truth? Now, any attempt to restrict, control, regulate social media, that will be the death knell for democracy in this country. Granted, social media is quite often irresponsible in what they say and what they do, and they need to take that to heart and behave in a more responsible, mature fashion. But if they don't, and they invite, in effect, government to come and regulate them, that would be very, very sad. It's almost telling, isn't it, that uh, when uh, the government of the day um, appears to be troubled or bothered even, um, singular term is better, colorblified uh, by the uh, reporting of uh, uh, our network, News First, uh, and the Sirius Network. Uh, that it's uh, to me that uh, although I know that there are procedures, rules, and so on and so forth, and you know nothing much may happen from it, but the fact that they are troubled or appear to be troubled and are talking and uh, engaging so-called knowledgeable men and maybe women to have a look at how to get the better of uh, this network, uh, that to me really is telling of the entire situation prevalent in the country. No, absolutely. And I mean, this has happened before to this particular network. We yes. know what happened in 2009. Yes. Yeah. And so these are definite warning signs of a government that recognizes that it's losing a huge constituency. And this has happened in the past with the UNP with its five, six majority and clinging on to power so desperately. Mm. You know. So the writing could well be on the wall. And so is this, uh, perverse as it may sound, uh, the right time for the opposition to emerge and uh, take up the, um, the challenge? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the opposition should take up the challenge, should come out as the strong defenders of democracy. Now, I understand that the SJB has gone to the Supreme Court with two fundamental rights yes. petitions with regard to what happened um, yesterday. I'm not quite sure what exactly the petitions are, but they do need to take the lead. Yes, they, they, I believe that they're challenging, uh, they're, they're trying to get a ruling on uh, the Quarantine Act mm. uh, okay. and, uh, and so on. So, um, do you think that um, Sri Lanka is in for troubled times, or do you think that uh, with the uh, advent of uh, Mr. Basil Rajapaksa, as you say, as a form of sort of trying to cement, binding it all together, uh, and you'll know all about binding with your cricket and all that. Is is this is he a bit of a binding instrument? Well, I mean, he has been the architect of the victories of the Rajapaksas, and his organisational skills mm. are much to be admired. Um, but I don't know whether his task is going to be as easy at the present moment when there is a lot of disaffection against the government. But a fair number of these, uh, uh, of his colleagues in Parliament ought to be rather grateful because uh, various cases against them have been uh, mysteriously uh, almost uh, done away with and dropped, charges been dropped and so on. Yes. So, so they, they ought to be lighting a candle every day and saying thank you very much. Dear no, no, they, they might say all of that but their supporters hmm. may turn around and say look you were guilty of such and such and you should be tried, as indeed we will be tried, the whole question of impunity should be dealt with squarely. You know, so if you have an election, then you're going to have the truth of the matter come out and probably bite you in the face. In your dealings with um, 
um, the international community and so on. Um, how ashamed are you to be described as Sri Lankan uh, when we have uh, a situation <laughs> where our president um, has pardoned a child killer and, and others? I don't want to mention that. Well, person. as you know, we are in court on that whole question of the Sunil Ratnaka pardon and indeed also the pardon for Venerable Nyanasara. Mm. Well, I'm not ashamed to be a Sri Lankan because I disassociate the country from the government. Mm -hmm. There is a Rajapaksa regime which is in power in Sri Lanka at the present moment. That Rajapaksa regime can disappear in five years, it can disappear in ten years, it can disappear tomorrow. But there will always be a Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And there will always be Sri Lankan citizens to pick up the pieces and proceed from there. But wouldn't you like to describe yourself uh, as Sri Lankan in a full and wholesome way? Uh, oh, government and everything No, else. of course, absolutely. Absolutely. But my fellow citizens mm. have chosen to put this regime into power. Now they are finding out that they probably made a mistake, a big mistake, and hopefully they will get a chance to rectify it. In terms of this government, w what can they do to, uh, to change course, you know, uh, do a U-turn if they have to, but to get it back and so to start actually fulfilling what the people want to, them to do? Well, I mean, I think, you know, this government has a two-thirds majority. There are serious, tough decisions that have to be made to set this country on the right tracks, particularly as far as the economy is concerned. We need to go back to the IMF, and going back to the IMF means that we will ac have to accept a certain amount of discipline. Mm. There will have to be sacrifices made. But if you have a two-thirds majority, presumably you are going to be able to garner the popular legitimacy for unpopular policies. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the only way to do it. So if I was the, the president or the cabinet or whatever, one of the first things I would do is go to the IMF. And why is the, uh, going to the IMF some sort of big bad thing? Or I don't that's know how they look at it. <laughs> you, you probably have to ask P.B. Jayasundra and Nivad Kabral that question. I don't mean to uh, put anyone down, but um, technically speaking, uh, very technically speaking, Dr. P. V. Jasundra is the secretary to the president. What on his, what's he got to do with it? Well, Mr. P. B. Jasundra was in charge of the economy under governments of the SLPP and the SLFP for mm. quite some time, mm. and therefore, when he has a president who doesn't seem to have any great economic knowledge or experience, then I suppose he has disproportionate control and influence over the trajectory of economic policy. And so, in your uh, view, um, leaning on the IMF will have to be done almost immediately. Well, I mean, we have an international community in which the IMF is the lender of the last resort. Hmm. Why not use it? And we have been to them about and 16 times we have times been, before. yeah, exactly. Interesting times ahead? Well, <laughs> in the spirit of the Chinese curse, yes. Interesting times ahead. Dr. Park Yasoti Saramunamutu, thank you very much for being uh, on, uh, on valued guest on Newsline Live. Thank you. Thank you, and that's the way it was on Newsline Live. Take care, have a great evening ahead of you. God bless you, and of course, it's now time for the primetime news from News First.